revolutionary stated, if I advance, follow me. If I retreat, kill me. And if I die, avenge me. A statement much more severe in life or war than in sports. But a true reflection of the types of people whose lives have been affected as a result of the time that they have spent in this part of the world. The part of France that touches the border of Belgium. Look out on the landscape and you'll see farms that have demanded the sweat of farmers for centuries. And imagine the pain that went into building the cobblestone roads that carried Napoleon's troops from here to there. This is also a land that has heard the cheers and seen the tears of soldiers of two world wars. Some of them have paid the ultimate price. And this then will be their home forever. Today, steel workers and field workers think these are desperate times. In many ways, this is a land that time forgot. But since 1896, these events, these emotions, and the history have all shaped Harry roubaix and made it the sacrifice that it is. The race sweeps through the historic countryside like a gust of wind, a sign that the long gloom of the European winter is over and that spring has come. For the people of the town of San Quentin, it is a chance to get outside, to open the shutters, to let the sunlight in, to cheer for their favorites. These are athletes in their streets, not soldiers. The pack is a strange phenomenon. The world's top riders, anonymous for now, pedaling shoulder to shoulder with rookies and has-beens, just cruising at anything from 25 to 30 miles an hour. Although the English are credited with the original development of bike racing, it is the French who have absorbed it into the heart and soul of their culture. And it's the French who have given this sport its language. Peloton means the pack. Wind resistance being all important in bike racing, it's easier to be in a pack where riders take turns breaking the wind than to ride by yourself. The echelon is a formation designed to lessen the effect of a crosswind. Riders form a diagonal line pointing into the wind. The rider at the front takes the full force of the wind while the others are sheltered. Riders take turns at the front even if they are from rival teams. It is part of the etiquette of the sport. Riders moving in echelon may get clear of the pack, and when that happens, it is called l'échappé, the breakaway, the escape from the peloton. A term that always raises an American eyebrow is le domestique, the domestic, literally a housekeeper. These are the riders whose job it is to help their team leader in any way they can. This may mean riding ahead of him to break the wind, perhaps giving him food. The domestique will give his leader a wheel or even his entire bike if there's any chance that his leader might miss l'échappé final, the winning break. Early in the race, there's time for the riders to talk amongst themselves, usually about the weather or money. The team managers who shadow them in cars loaded down with spare parts and changes of clothes. A simple wave of the hand is enough to bring your team manager alongside. The team manager is often a former rider, like Cyril Guimard here of Team Super U. He must be a field general, a strategist who looks upon his men like a chess player would look at his pieces on the board. The object being to keep his best rider resting for as long as possible, then to position him for the race to the finish. A rider is dependent upon his manager, not so much during the first hours as later in the race when he's on the verge of exhaustion and unable to think clearly for himself. 22 teams in the race, each with its own plans. One of these teams, backed by the American company 7-Eleven, began its day this way. Davis gets up early, like 5.30. Plenty of car bones. The preparation of the bikes. Each bike, and a team will have at least 20, is worth about $2,000. Massage. A rider's body, especially his legs, is looked at unemotionally, like a machine to be fine-tuned, just like his bicycle for the job ahead.
Despite a kind of locker room lightheartedness, 7-Eleven was under pressure. Their manager, Mike Neal, had been injured in a car crash three days before. His assistant, Noel Dijon Carré, would be calling the shots. Maps, tactics, a certain do or die urgency. Bike racing, part sport, part military maneuver. Dotting the countryside are trees that were planted in precision years before, maybe to please the king during his jaunts in the country. But ahead lies the Arenberg Forest, planted by nature, and the cobblestones planted by man. Every cyclist can read his digital speedometer and tell when to get ready. 50 miles into the race, and Laurent Fignon of France still looks fresh. Two-time winner of the Tour de France, winner this year of the grueling Milan San Remo, and still not too cocky to make a move just yet. In last year's race at about this spot, a group of no-names broke away. Veterans like Fignon ignored them, and they all lost. What about this year? When is the right time? Who will go first? Different answers would be found aboard each and every cycle. Harry Roubaix, its unique character, are made from cobblestone, laid by hand centuries ago. There are 22 cobblestone sections between here and Roubaix. Some are as short as a few hundred yards. Most are a mile or two long. Every rider knows what the cobblestones mean. The brutal, physical pounding accompanied all the way by the risk of being involved with a crash or having your bike break or perhaps getting a flat tire. But the rough road offers something else, something very special, a chance to prove your grit and determination. Chance to show how tough you really are. The cobblestones have humbled most of the riders who have ridden over them. They've made a few heroes, too. But one thing is for sure. When you get here, you have to make up your mind. Defend your position or attack. 63 miles into the race, approaching the outskirts of Troisville, where the cobblestones begin, the pack was still tightly bunched. No breakaways yet. Sean Kelly, the Irishman who had twice been the winner of this race, made a move and rode to the front. It was exactly as he had planned it. Well, the, the plan is to go on to the fourth section of cobbles in the first 10, 10 riders, 15 riders. That's what you have to do because there's so many crashes in the first two or three sectors of cobbles. Uh, you know, if you're behind, well, then you get caught up in, in, in those crashes and you don't know, come back. It's, it takes such an effort, you pay for them definitely. Bobby, the cobblestones, dead ahead. As the pack funnels onto the narrow road, most riders shift to a higher gear, thus pedaling at somewhat lower RPM. The idea being better control. The bikes are fitted with tires that have oversized sidewalls to cushion the impact of the cobble. Handlebars are thickly padded to reduce the vibration in the rider's arm. The faster you ride the cobblestones, the smoother they seem, but the greater is the risk that something will go wrong. like this you build landmarks into your mind simply stated something like this when i reach there i want to be here evidently the peloton was even in their thinking when i reach the church at Viesley, i want to be in the pack there are relatively few dropouts compared to previous years when mud and dust made carnage the operative word Now in the town of Solem, a landmark in the rider's mind for food and for drink. Only possible if you can find your team helpers in the blur of people that line the road. Approaching the halfway mark, a Frenchman, Jean-Claude Calotti, makes his move. Everyone had been waiting for the break, and this was it. There were 
conditions of a year ago when a domestique, Dirk de Mol of Belgium, won the race with a move like Colotti's. And just like a year ago, the veterans stayed back. The similarity ends there. Last year, it was a group that made up Le Chappé, or The Escape. Now it was one man sliding to the edge of the cobblestones to make his ride more smooth. He would have to defy tremendous odds and the law of aerodynamics. One man cannot slice the wind as sharply as the pack. Perhaps Colotti felt strong or lucky, maybe thinking riders from the peloton would pull away with him. Still, no one came out to challenge, and nothing in Colotti's past said he could go it alone. The distance between the lonely Frenchman and a group of skeptics grew. The number of seconds that favored Colotti was 40. The number of things that could go wrong was impossible to count. Seconds behind this bold and maybe foolish move, Laurent Fignon experienced a simple flat tire. Expect mishaps, but minimize their effect. In instances like this, a cyclist may be saved by a freelance tire supplier who cruises the course. A move like this should take only nine, maybe ten seconds. This one was agonizingly long. The catch-up to the pack would be equally tough. Some French cycling fans have said Fignon hasn't been tough enough for races like this. Now his chance to prove them wrong. Moving into and out of the city of Valenciennes. 15 cobblestone sections to go. Now past the midway point, and the race finally had a leader, and he had company. Jean-Claude Collotti, 51st last year, and now Sean Yates, the Englishman on the American 7-11 team. Yates loves to ride in front, and in so doing, captured a stage of the Tour de France a year ago. The chase was being applied by a group that was without stars, but with hard workers, like Frenchman Duclos LaSalle. Second place six years ago, number 91, and Jean-Marie Bumpers, number 58, a Belgian trying to postpone the end of his undistinguished career. Up in front, Yates and Colotti played their game until Colotti raised his hand and called for a conference. or support. Difficult to tell. Perhaps Colotti had abandoned his duties as a supporting player somewhere many miles ago. Perhaps he was having his greatest day. Either way, the strategy was in place for the most famous stretch of Pave, the one through the Arenberg Forest, lined by thousands of fans and treacherous to the dreams of many in the 86 Paris-Roubaix races before. Right now at your Napa Auto Parts store, you'll find... The race reflects its surroundings. This abbey built in 1129 has barely withstood the test of time, yet the ruins still show the effort of the workers, not unlike the riders of Paris-Roubaix. History is in front, next to and behind you, as Pierre Salinger explains. Compiègne, a city of 45,000 residents where the Paris-Roubaix got underway today, is a site of history. Of Roman origin in the 6th century, it was once called Compendium. But from the Middle Ages, it has been a center of French culture. This royal palace, started in the 14th century, was the favorite country home of Kings Louis XV and XVI of France. After the Revolution, it was also used frequently by Napoleon. It was also here in Compiègne that Joan of Arc was captured in 1430, after her attempts to liberate parts of France from English rule. She was executed the next year. But it is in the 20th century that Compiègne expanded from a site of French history to one of world history. When World War I broke out in 1914, it plunged Europe into a bloody conflict. The United States came to join the French in the struggle against the Germans in 1917. The war lasted four years, but on November 11, 1918, it came to an end here in Compiègne, which had been occupied by the Germans during most of the war. In this railroad car, 
the French and Germans signed the armistice that ended World War I. The railroad car became a museum dedicated to France's World War I victory. But a little more than 20 years later, it would become an image of French defeat and humiliation. World War II had broken out in 1939. And by June of 1940, France had been crushed by the Germans. On June 21, 1940, Adolf Hitler came to the very same railroad car and forced the French to surrender. Compiègne was liberated from the Germans by the Americans in September of 1944. With all these military events taking place in Compiègne, it is not surprising that in this city there is this extraordinary museum with more than 100,000 soldiers like these made of lead, wood, plastic, and paper. You can see the bodyguards of George Washington during the American Revolution, the funeral parade of Napoleon I, and 12,000 soldiers in the historic Battle of Waterloo. So as the cyclists move north on the tough one-day race, they leave behind them a very special city on the banks of the Waz River, a city which has seen joy and tragedy, war and peace. Until now, the race has been the safest in recent memory, perhaps lulling the riders into a false sense of security. And this crash comes not on the cobblestones where you might expect it, but on smooth pavement. Dag Otto Lauritsen is involved. An elbow injury will end his day. Stephen Roach's challenge is over too, before his strategy has had a chance to unfold. The safe haven of the pack in a split second has become a trap. And as Yates and Kaladi race toward the Arenberg Forest, a wave of caution spreads through the pack behind them. The Arenberg Forest Road is open but one day a year this one, and thousands seize the opportunity to grab what they consider to be the prize place to view the race, still led by Colotti and Yates. They arrive hours before to view the event, and the event sends them home as it passes in seconds. The road is almost perfectly straight, but it might as well be a labyrinth, for confusion reigns.
Matteo leading the six. Flankert, the man with Belgian family ties, was next. Duclos LaSalle, a Frenchman who once finished number two and knows that you are remembered only when you win. Then three more Belgians, Dirk de Wolf, one of the few confident on the pave, Edwin Van Hoydon, the class of the group, and Jean-Marie Vompers, who had no business being with him. With just over 10 miles to go, the pounding has made the handlebars difficult to grasp. But suddenly, it is De Wolf who decides to go to his strength, confidence on the cobblestones, to grasp the lead. He can only hope to build a lead such that he can withstand a sprint at the finish, for which he is not well suited. In so doing, would he wind up like Yates, Vignon, and long-forgotten Jean-Claude Collotti? Or would these last few pushes of the pedals be master strokes. An overflow crowd in the Roubaix Velodrome is watching the final minutes of the 87th edition of this classic race, which began more than six hours before and 160 miles ago. More and more it appears that the man who appears first in the stadium will be a complete surprise. A surprise like Dirk DeWolf. The chase made up of riders all of different teams has to band together trying to chew through the late afternoon air, working as a newfound team with a mission with a prime objective of being close enough when the cobbles finally end and the sprint on asphalt begins. Suddenly, the other outcast in the group, Jean-Marie Bumpers, pulls away for a solo pursuit of the leader. The two men with the worst credentials at the front were running one-two. For Dirk DeWolf, once told he would never be a great racer, was riding where Sean Kelly, Stephen Roche, or Fignon was supposed to be, and everyone was chasing him. He was sailing over waters he knew, the rough seas provided by the cobblestones that were so frequently his training ground in Belgium. Bompers was waiting perfectly to use the smooth sections of road between the pave, slicing through his favorites of the 14 gears and moving closer still. Now the feeling of a submarine captain. The periscope rises above the water, and there directly in front of you is your prey. This was Bompers spotting DeWolf and pushing even harder, all ahead full. Now they are together, approaching the outskirts of Roubaix. On one hand, DeWolf had been caught, but on the other, and more importantly, he now has help. Ironically, the two men had once been teammates and are now neighbors and training partners. Might they have dreamed of a moment like this? Now between them, they will decide this race. Bumper signals for advice. What do I do? Try to build a lead? Wait for DeWolf to move? Behind, aware suddenly that they have run out of time and distance. Van Hoida, Duco LaSalle, Matteo, Planker. Today, they will race for third. With the last of the cobblestones rolling beneath their wheels, Dirk DeWolf, 28, and Jean-Marie Vompers, 30, both old for bike racing, are alone now with their thoughts and the special chemistry that exists between two men who have left behind both the pack and their teammates and are alone with each other in a strange world neither has ever experienced the lead this late in a major race. Both are Belgians, drawn forward now by the magnet of their homeland, but also strangely repelled by fear of entering the velodrome first and being drafted and passed right before the line. Who would lead? Neither man seemed to want to. Just minutes ago, they exchanged positions willingly in an effort to conserve, be aerodynamic, and maintain their lead. Now, a move to the front has much more meaning. Dirk DeWolf's press to the lead means that when they enter the velodrome for one and a half laps to determine the winner, he wants to be the one they greet first. And so it is to be. Bumpers seems content to let it happen.
At this point, both men know it is simply a matter of who has how much left. They have visited 600,000 people along the way. And after so many miles, it has come down to yards. For a chance to be on a list of champions that includes Eddie Merckx, the Belgian cycling king they idolize, win $25,000. And to say you won one of the most prestigious and traditional races in an upset to be remembered. DeWolf maintains his position, surely expecting bumpers to make a move. But when? that Bumper, who was supposed to help someone else win today, helps himself to a victory in the 87th, Harry Roubaix. And so for the second year in a row, a butler claims the mansion. A domestique, a worker, wins the race. How did it happen? What was the final strategy? Our liaison to the cycling world is British journalist Bill Liggett, who speaks to the champion, Don Marie Bumpers. When you came here to the velodrome, you stayed in second place. Was that a tactic? Yeah, Peter Post uh, told me to to take the second uh, position so that I could uh, see what Dirk Wolf wanted to do, and uh, I attacked, and they couldn't uh, pass me. I think we were the two best in front, and uh, Dirk de Wolf was very strong, but I was a little bit stronger, I think. And when did you feel you had the race won? After the finish. <laughs> it is very possible Jean-Marie Bompers will never win another classic race. But in six hours and four six minutes, his position on the team, his feel about himself, and the success of his career changed. No matter what happens, Jean-Marie will have a cobblestone trophy which will forever remind him of the day he conquered the Ave when no one thought he could. Edward Van Hoydonk of Belgium won the battle for Thor. Sean Kelly ended 15th. 111 didn't finish. Greg LeMond among them. It was a day to keep many teams alive for another time in July. 21 days known as the Tour de France. 